Faith Works Live. Here's your host, Rebecca Haney. Oh, it's such a good day to be with you. It's a day the Lord has made, which means we can rejoice and be glad in it. Um, but it's also just an awesome time anytime I get to hang out with my brothers and sisters in Christ to talk about what it looks like to live out our faith in this crazy old world. Um, the darker that it seems all around us, um, yeah, it's not fun, but I do think God has put us here for just such a time as this, and it's never been easier. It's never been simpler, I should say, to shine for Christ um, when it's the darkest than the light shines out the most. So I think there's a there's a lot of great reasons to rejoice and be glad today. God is still working and he's working in the lives of young people. I think I hear that a lot. And as a mom, I care greatly for the next generation. I care about the confusion that many kids seem to find and the earnest questioning that they have about these big questions of the universe. What is my purpose? You know, is God real? Is all that stuff too good to be true? Can I trust it? And um, one of the the greatest teams that I have seen, their great heart and uh, their um, just their their fortitude really of dealing with because they have to have a lot of energy to keep up with these kids uh, that answers the questions of the next generation is uh, the our friends over at Reasons for Hope. And um, a new voice on our airwaves is Dave Glander. He's part of their team and he is uh, he's an apologist. He's a former atheist. So I'd love to hear more about his story. He's an author. He's a speaker and he um, work. He has a great passion to reach the next generation for Christ. Dave, it is an honor to have you on our airwaves. How are you? Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. I'm good, except for I, I sound a little bit like Batman right now because <laughs> I'm on, um, I think we've gone nine weeks straight of youth camps and I've got one more left. And so my voice is like, help. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a feat well, of Hercules, nine camps in really, a row. It, it, you know what? It's such a blessing. Just this last camp that we had, I'm not going to lie. We got there and, um, we met the so it was a it was a plant. So we're we're expanding across the country. <laughs> Excuse me. This was one of our expansion camps. Mm. And so I've never met any of a lot of these camps we do. We have alumni that come back. This was a brand new one. So I've never met any of these folks before. They got there. That was some of the roughest students. I, mm. I mean, they were just closed up, mad at the world. Sure. Didn't want to engage. My mom and dad made me come. They all had a drug problem. They were drugged there. Okay. Um, <laughs> a, yeah, sure. Two, yeah. Anyway, um, staring at the floor during worship, not looking at you when you're teaching. And I got to be honest with you, after nine weeks, you know, you're, you're, you're running on fumes. And so it's like, all right, Holy Spirit, I need that energy. And when they came in, it was like, they just sucked the energy out of the room, you know? Yeah. But here's the thing. They were curious and they were asking questions. They may not have been verbalizing them, but in, internally I knew they were asking the same questions we deal with all the time. So we just, we started doing what we do and we just, we just hit right down the, down the path of the worldviews that they're dealing with. And by the end of the week, they were, I'm not going to say they were like worshiping, but their lips were moving. No, there big you plus. go. Yeah, I know. Big plus. Um, when you were teaching, they weren't staring at the floor. They were staring at you. And um, and then by the time we had open mic on Friday, I mean, there was tears being shed and stories being told that these kids were holding on to all week long. Yeah. That, you know, one kid said he just lost his mom last year to a drug overdose. Oh. And um, but the year before for Christmas, she had gone to the thrift store and got a box of broken toys and put the broken toys under the tree to try and make Christmas good for him. And he goes, that's the love of a mother right there. And we're all just like, you know, yeah. so it's no wonder they came in. So walled up everywhere because I mean, they're just, these kids are going through kids nowadays are going through adult stuff that they shouldn't be going through for another 10 years. But the reality is, is this world, because of how engaged this world has become with social media and just, gadgetry everywhere that gets them plugged into mostly where they don't belong they're just dealing with stuff mm -hmm. now so yeah it's, it's been a um it's been a blessing of a summer i've been doing youth ministry for about 20 years and it doesn't get easier every year because the problems just seem to to magnify Wow. Well, and I, I want to talk a bit about that. I wonder, though, how you got into youth ministry in the first place, because I hear you have a pretty interesting story. <laughs> well, I um I did not grow up around the church at all. As a matter of fact, I I grew up in New England and um, up in New England. I was born and raised in 
there's not a whole lot of Jesus up in that area of the country. And so I just, it wasn't even like a, um, I guess you could say I didn't even think about it. You know what I mean? Like I never even really thought about like, would I accept or reject this Christian idea because it just wasn't around. Yeah. And I went to public school and, and, and in public school, they dogmatically taught that we came from, you know, either alien impregnation or two stars colliding together. But one way or the other, we came from a great cosmic accident. There was no purpose. And if there's no purpose behind it, where do you find meaning, hope, value, you know? So I grew up, you know, I started doing drugs when I was six years old. I was molested most of my life from my uncle and and just, just, it, it's a long story, but it just mm-hmm. wasn't, I didn't have one of those like, you know, Disney magical. Well, of course now Disney's so far left that I'm not even sure that's magical anymore, but mm-hmm. nonetheless, I didn't have one of those magical upbringings. It was, um, it was through some turmoil that, but my mom was there and she always tried to make sure that I had, you know, like a childhood upbringing, like, you know what I mean? But it was just Mm -hmm. tough for her because of all the things that were going on. And so by the time I was 18, I didn't realize it, but I was an atheist. I just had never put a term on it before. But when I moved to Georgia, which I'm still in Georgia now, I've been here for a long time. um, I'm in the Bible belt. I might be in the buckle of the belt, you know? And so when I moved to Georgia, that's when I realized that, man, I don't like these people that call themselves Christians. There was a church on every corner, but yet they all seem to be just talking about each other. Every time I would overhear a conversation, this person did that, this person, you know, pointing fingers back and forth and they couldn't seem to agree on much of anything. And so when I would start probing into like, what are you guys talking about? You know, they didn't have any answers for me ever, never. Like I would ask simple questions, you know, like, what is your faith all about? Well, you just, you just go to church. It sounded like a country club and, Sound mm-hmm. like a bunch of miserable people in country club. And if I ask complicated questions about like, well, how do you know there's even a God in the first place? I could never get any answers. And so I just, I determined that I wasn't just an atheist. I was a militant atheist because I just could not stand these people that call themselves Christians and just didn't have anything that I wanted. You know what I mean? And so okay. that went on for quite some time until I was, I'm making a long story short, but um when I was 26 years old, my mom died of cancer and she was like my, like, she was my rock through everything. I could just, I could go to my mom for anything. And so when she died, I just, um, I had, I had been doing drugs for a while now, but I had tried to stay away from the hard drugs. But when she died, I just was so empty. And again, if you don't have God, where are you going to find hope or where, where, where would I find any sort of joy or, or meaning in, in any of this, you know? And so, um, so I got, I ended up getting hooked on meth for about three plus years and, um, meth, the crystal meth that just, that did me in. I lost everything. I temporarily lost my family. My house was in foreclosure. My car got repossessed. My business was being shut down. I ended up living as a homeless guy in a, in a house that hadn't um, closed yet in a state that hadn't closed yet. And, um, I just, it just was miserable. And so finally I just got so tired. I mean, I was just tired. I was, I was just like right now I'm tired, but it's a good tired. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's a Holy spirit tired back then. That was just a, um, life is, I, I was, I was afraid to try and kill myself because I was afraid, like I didn't have a gun. And so I was afraid, like if I jumped in front of a truck, I would end up as a paraplegic and just, you know, look stupid for failing at trying to kill myself. Or if I tried to overdose, I would end up in the hospital, get my stomach pumped. I was so low, Rebecca, that I was like, I was afraid to fail at failing. And so, um, so finally I, I went back to my home that was in foreclosure, but I hadn't foreclosed yet. And my wife was there and my son was asleep luckily. And she had been reading this book called knowing Jesus personally. And I just started to mock that book and I started to mock her for reading the book. Then I started to mock the idea of God. And my argument was this, what kind of a God would create me and then leave me to this? Like I was a 110 pound meth addict who would, I was so depressed and so low that I couldn't imagine that a loving God, why would a loving God create me? And then this is all that there is to offer that it's not much, it's not much of a plan, you know? And so I just started yelling at him going, you stupid, you know, I just, I didn't think anybody was listening. You know, I was just, I didn't know where else to turn, you know, again, I'm repeating, if you don't have God, where do you go? You know? And so I was just yelling at my ceiling 
And, um, and I guess my altar call was if you're God do something about it. I remember saying that. And, um, my wife managed to get me to bed that night somehow. I don't know how, because on meth, you go for, you know, a week or so without sleeping at all until your body just crashes. So maybe I was in crash mode. I don't know, but, um, Rebecca, I'm not exactly sure the rest of the story, how it went for the next days or weeks. I just know that something transitioned in that moment where I said, if you're God, do something about it Mm -hmm. to the point where I don't remember what it's like to feel high or what drip tastes like. So that doesn't happen on meth. You've got to go down methadone, which is another lesser narcotic, um, usually, excuse me, usually treat centers. You know, you just don't, you don't walk away from meth. It's not how that one works. And so somehow or another, he gave me the strength to just walk away from it. And so, and then I just had this joy. And I remember I'm not a big Joel Osteen fan now because he doesn't really preach the whole gospel. But at the time, his book, um, Your Best Life Now had just come out. And so he was doing a book tour and he was on the morning show with that Joel Osteen smile, you know, Mm -hmm. I hadn't smiled like that in a long time. And here's this guy talking about the God of the Bible. And he made it seem like there was something to be joyous about versus all these other Christians who just kept nagging at each other. And so I I have to give credit where credit's due, where God used Joel Osteen for a a, a half a moment in my life just to show me that there's joy that can be had, you know? And so it was at that moment that I realized that something supernatural had to have happened. And up until that point, as an atheist, natural is the only view you got. There is no supernatural. And so, um, when I realized that some God out there had done this, I went on the search for who it was and started studying Buddhism first. And that didn't line up. I started studying Islam. That didn't line up. And my mother-in-law gave me a case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And when I got to the part of the historicity of Jesus, like he was actually here, that blew my mind. I was like, I thought this dude was just a made up figure of whatever that people would emulate some good dude. I don't know. I just, Mm -hmm. I never... I never even wrestled with the fact that he was here until that moment. But then once I wrestled with the fact that, wait a second, historically speaking, he was here. That's when I picked up the Bible. And when I read the gospel for the first time, I knew all of a sudden that joy that I had, that peace, that freedom, all of the stuff that I had been feeling for these few weeks or however long it took for me to put two and two together with who, who did it to me. Um, the gospels answered all of that. And so that was when I, I turned my life over to Christ. But that was also immediately what got me into apologetics was mm. apologetics is what drove me to the truth of Christ. So that's what got me started in apologetics immediately. So then I started going, what else don't I know? Started studying. And apologetics, you're supposed to like choose a field and stay in that that lane. I had ADD, man. I was like one minute I'm <laughs> studying history, one minute I'm studying biology the next minute i'm studying philosophy and i just started going what else you know i lived almost 30 years of my life believing a lie Mm. and so i wanted to know like what else have i been believing that's not true and so yeah and then how i got into youth ministry was real simple i was in church the guy said hey man you want to help and i said sure and i went up (laughs) he was a youth pastor i helped for a, a couple of weeks and then they were going on a um on a weekend uh retreat he was like, you want to, you want to come and volunteer to go? I was like, sure. Why not? And I went, I just fell in love with you. They're much fun than adults. Adults get stuffy. <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> as, as, Car- as Carl said, as Carl said, he's like, if I never have to talk to another old person, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Except the one in the mirror. We're kind of stuck. Well, with them. <laughs> yeah, that one talks too much. <laughs> Dave, your story is super powerful. So, and, and I appreciate so much the, the, just the depths that you have to go through sometimes in order to wake up. I know for me, it's, I I had a much different story than you, but still, I mean, I was blinded by my own pride. I was blinded by, you know, thinking I'm really not all that bad. I had kind of the opposite experience growing up in the church and all of that. It can take um, like almost a volcano going off in your life or a tsunami hitting your life. Maybe that's a better metaphor to, um, to realize, to wake up to the fact that the gospel is true, but it's also true for you, that yeah. it, it has implications for you, that, that Jesus is real and that that changes everything. Um, because I, I think 
maybe a lot of us in Christian homes take for granted that people know about who Jesus is, that that they know the story. They yes, Jesus, Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. And maybe there's still kind of this cultural awareness, but more and more of that is receding. More of that is, is fading away to the point where people do not know, especially young people have not heard the basics. They don't know the story of Noah or Abraham or Moses or you know any of this biblical background. And most specifically, most importantly, they need to know that Jesus is real that he really did, really was a real person born in a real yeah. place at a real time, um, and that that changes everything. Do you think kids are are open to that, or are they still um, um, rejecting that because of the implications? So let me say a few things to what you just said. Number one, isn't it good that God will let us get to the bottom of ourselves to knock that thick-headed numbskull out of us mm-hmm. that gets in the way of the gospel? You oh, know, yeah. like, we and I tell that. people, I'm like, I tell people, I'm like, I thank God he let me get to the bottom of a barrel because I'm so thick headed and and I probably had a lot of pride that I wouldn't have listened. You know what I'm saying? Like, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't have received it. The best thing I brought to Christ when I met Christ was nothing. I mean, I I was literally so empty in every way, shape and possible. I mean, I just was just empty that I didn't bring an agenda to God saying, okay, God, I'll serve you. If I'll do this, if here's my list of commands, I didn't, I just, I literally was like, I'm done. If you want to do this, it's going to be your way. Cause I'm done. I, I have no further energy or efforts or ideas to throw at this anymore. I played God for nearly 30 years and it didn't work. Yeah. So it was, um, it was relieving to know that I didn't have to. So just to, to your point, yeah, he'll he'll break you at your knees if that's what it's going to take to get you to finally humble yourself to the gospel. And I thank God. But I always tell people, I'm like, you don't have to do that. Like, you can humble yourself without him allowing you to get to that point. Um, to your second point, in my almost 30 years before I met the Lord, there was the Bellinger family when I was 12 years old that took me to church for about two months, maybe, on and off. I couldn't quite dig it. They were a little geeky for me at the time because I had mm-hmm. I was rough around the edges, you know what I mean. So I was they were a little bit um, a little bit too streamlined for me at the time. But nonetheless, that was one family, and then there was a lady that I had tried to do some um, I forget what that marketing is like that like tiered marketing thing. I got involved with that for a minute, but this lady tried to, to tell me about Jesus. Two people, thirty years. Mm-hmm. So to your point most of America doesn't know what the gospel is. I I had no idea that Easter had anything at all to do with the resurrection. Nothing. I thought it was honey poop eggs somehow, and that's what we do. I'm just being it's honest. It's not clear. Like, it's not clear. It's, no, it's, no, it's not clear at all. The Bible says, how will they know unless somebody tells them? Right. And And Christians have been so quiet for so long and I'm not sure if it's because we assume people know more than it is. If I'm just being honest with you, Rebecca, I don't think they believe it themselves enough to share it. Like mm. that's what I'd run into. So, yeah. I mean, cause if you truly believe the gospel, then why are you not sharing it everywhere you go? Like, I mean, even Penn Jillette, I'm sure you've seen that, that clip of him. He's an outspoken atheist. And he was like, if you truly believe there's a hell How bad would you have to hate somebody to not proselytize them? I mean, that's a leading atheist saying, look, I'm not going to stop you from telling me. I respect you for trying to tell me because obviously you believe that to be true. So if people aren't telling people, then I just don't think they believe it themselves. You know, it's that kind of armchair psychologist of Christianity. But so to your question, do you receive it? Absolutely. There's a caveat, though. They'll spot a fake from a mile away. And that's one of the things that works with reasons for hope is you're going to get what you get. I don't have, I don't have a second speed I can turn on for you that, (laughs) you know, puts church mode on or something. I completely forgot to pack church clothes, you know, and and for me, church clothes is pants instead of shorts and a button down shirt instead of a, instead of a t-shirt. But I completely forgot when I left camp last week, that Sunday, Saturday, I was going to speak at a conference. I was in North Carolina. I had to drive from North Carolina directly from camp over to Tennessee wow. at a conference on Saturday. And then the church on Sunday morning, 
I was like, oh my gosh, I completely forgot to pack church clothes, you know? And so, but I made a joke of it. I said, hey, thanks for welcoming me in my camp clothes because I'm still in camp mode. Everybody laughed and we moved on. And it was mm-hmm. a church who wasn't there to play. And listen, I took a picture of that. I said, I've never done this before. But from the pulpit, I took a picture of the church because it was filled to the nines and, nice. and two different services. They actually had to have three. I, I did the second two. And I was just like, you know, what's making this work is because they're transparent. We, you know, we're back to the whole like youth can spot a fake from a mile away. They can. The church needs to stop playing church. We've done that for long enough and it doesn't work. And so it's not just that I think that youth are receptive. Because I do, they're, listen, I, again, going back to those kids from last week that were tough, it was not just transparency, but it was dealing with the issues. You know, like we we dealt with the LGBTQ community in a real way. We dealt with, I gave one talk, it's called Why God? Mm-hmm. And it has to do with like, okay, I understand that, you know, biblical Christianity says abortion's wrong, homosexuality's wrong, transgender's wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But I think too much time as a church, we're like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You know, we're just pointing fingers without explaining why. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, it's important to ask God why. And when we break it down in all of the abortion, trans, gay, all of those, it just comes down to family. And when you show that God is a God of family, that, that that's, that's what, the structure is that when you start, but um, obviously I'm unpacking it in this small, I unpack it this big in a talk. But I mean, when you explain why does he say abortion is wrong, you show him the science behind when is a baby conceived. And I have a, um, a, um, it's not Nat Geo, it's Discovery Channel video on what happens when, when the sperm and egg and a lightning shoots from the inside of the egg, hardening that. I'm like, that's their science. That's not Christian science. But you tell me that's not the assigning of a soul. That's when conception happens. So if God says do not murder and, there's, and, it's, and it's conceived, uh, the, the baby's a, a person at conception, you know, you start breaking it down like this, they listen. But if you just sit there and go, your generation's wrong. Here's why you're wrong. This is what's wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. They shut down and sure. they don't listen to anything. So well, and who wouldn't? It's about being transparent and dealing with it. Who wouldn't? If all you're doing yeah, is being con- confronted. And especially if you feel like, oh, you're just one person telling me how to live my life. You're trying to control me and my decisions and make that, that it's all about control, which is another one of those big lies that's out there about against yeah. religion. And, you know, there's there's some truth to that, that that can happen in some some places and some religions at some times. Uh, but the to understand the person of Christ and to understand yeah. that. And, and I've talked to lots of people who were, you know, had outright rebellion going on. Um, no matter what, it was like, I don't want to listen to anybody or anything, but they couldn't ignore the person of Jesus. And yeah. that if Christ is Lord, then what I want, ultimately, you, you just have to come to him with empty hands and say, it's not about me anymore. And maybe this isn't what I want to hear. And and you can get to the point where you can hear some uncomfortable things if you know, number one, that that the people that are talking to you really care about you. I think that's pretty yeah. important uh, yeah. that, that it's not just, you know, something that they're doing or again, an attempt to control or to manipulate at all, but that you, yet that you're genuine uh, in your love for that other person, oh. but also that Jesus is real. Yeah. And that, that again, I, I go back to the fact that I think that changes everything, put aside the the politics and the stereotypes and, and, yeah. you know, any other baggage that might be out there with churches and church leaders. Um, it, it comes back to, to who Jesus is and what do you do with that? Well, and that's, um, there's a cool thing that's happened through the years of doing equip and it's, I started doing it, um, years ago and now my team has picked it up. Let's say we start Sunday night, whenever we start, whether it's Sunday night, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, whenever orientation happens where we get everybody together for the first time. It's like, all right, here's what to expect through the week. Here's our rules. You know, you just kind of go over setting the groundwork. And I tell them right then, it's like, I love you. And I said, I know you're sitting there going, this dude doesn't even know me. We we haven't even talked yet. I, I realize that's going through your head. But I guarantee you by the end of this week, you're going to understand, I'm genuinely telling you, I love you. I would not be here if it weren't for the fact that I love you. So my team has actually picked up on that. And all of them, genuinely speaking, say, we love you. Like, that's why we're here for you. And and you're right. When they when they know that you genuinely care for them, it's, it's, it's like I tell them, I'm like, look, 
how many STDs can you get if you follow God's um, direction for dating and, and you wait until you get married to have mm -hmm. sex? And they're like, none. And I was like, okay, is that a bad thing? No. How about an unplanned pregnancy? How many of those can happen if you wait until you're married? Not, oh, well, that's not a bad thing either. How about all the neural pathways that are developed when you are intimate with somebody who's not going to be your husband or wife? How many of those could you avoid? Not, it's like God's not here to like stamp on your party. He literally knows what's best. And when you look at it from the aspect of Christ loves you, that's why he's He's not here to, to be some dictator over your life. He's literally telling. And then I joke with him. Here's another thing that the church has got wrong. Then I joke with him. I'm like, look, I'm telling you, find your husband or your wife and go have lots of sex. Lots of it. Go right. nuts. Right. It's the greatest gift ever. They don't hear that from the pulpit. What they hear from the pulpit is it's dirty. It's rotten. It's a sin. And I, and I remember about two years ago watching this girl who had walked away from the face. She had a testimony online somewhere. And she had waited until her, her wedding night, and so did her husband. But because the church had done such a bad job on saying sex is dirty, it's, mm. she said, even though we waited, it still felt filthy in the moment. And I was like, that's, that's bad. That's not, again, we have, to, we have to embrace how to teach the doctrines of God. We can't just slam it over their head and tell them it's wrong and, and hope that's a Band-Aid that fixes their understanding. Like mm -hmm. we, we have got to do a better job of that because this girl literally walked away from the faith because it was so devastating to her. And I'm like, all that, all that had to change Rebecca is one person like me coming along going, look, find your husband and wife, go have lots of it, go nuts, go crazy. Go be you know, fruitful, be fruitful be and fruitful multiply. And multiply. <laughs> that was the first blessing. God blessed it. And he said, it's good. It's very good. Mm -hmm. So, but that's what I'm saying. Like we have to be real with this generation it's not just this generation. It's it's the generation of young people that we lost. You know, the yeah. the 20 to 35 year old that are wandering right now because we lost them, you know, and and we're on the other side of that information now. See, for I came into this 20 years ago and for two decades, it's like we've been scratching our head going, why are they leaving? Why are why is there a mass exodus of the church? You know, it was never like that before. Well, now we're on the other side of it. We've done the stats. We've done the studies. We've done the interviews. We've done the research. And all of the polls come back to, we've got to get them solid answers. That's where apologetics comes in. And I'm not, listen, I'm not saying apologetics is going to save anybody. That's the work of the Holy Spirit through the cross that, that Christ laid his life down on. Mm -hmm. But apologetics, I, I get invites to go outside of the country. And most of the time I turn them down because I say, I'm a missionary to America. America is so lost right now because we have this post-Christian worldview that truth is relative, that the Bible can't be trusted, that yeah. Christianity is just an old, outdated, dogmatic, you know, and I'm like, it's not, though. It's fruit for life, you know, but if we don't teach it the right way, it sounds like an archaic, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like that old, grumpy, pa and listen, if you're an old, grumpy pastor who... <laughs> insist on wearing your suit and tie because you then that I'm not but I just want you to look at your congregation and see how many young people are in your congregation because it's time that we stop playing you know there and I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn it back over to you after I say this because <laughs> here I want to qualify that because it sounds sure. like I'm saying you shouldn't give God your best with dress give God your best and if a suit and tie is your best then that's great I am totally uncomfortable in a suit and tie I tried it it's not my thing. If you're dead or I'm marrying you, it's about the only time that I'm going to get in a suit and die. And that's only if I have to. But the reason why I say that is I was at a restaurant. I was meeting with a youth pastor one day. And we this conversation came up about the shirt and tie or the coat and jacket and all this stuff. And I just said, you know, we just need to stop putting such an emphasis on that. And just literally we say, come as you are to worship. Okay, come as you are then. Mm -hmm. And about that time, the manager of the restaurant comes walking by check on him. And my friend was always diligent about saying, Hey, we're going to pray before we ease or anything we can pray for you about. And, um, and the guy was like, yeah, I'm all right. And so I was like, huh, that was a weird response. Most of the time people say my sister need prayer or my, whatever. Sure. But he was like, I'm all right. And I said, what happened? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, obviously something happened between you and the church. And out of nowhere, he goes, well, my mom could never afford clothes that were nice. And so we would put on the nicest clothes we had 
but they weren't the same as what everybody else had on. Mm. And so when we went to church, it was picked on. And so as a little kid, this now is a grown man who still reverts back to when he was 10 years old and got picked on by kids because he didn't have the right clothes on. And so that's why I get a little soapbox with like the, let's just stop playing church. If, if somebody can't afford clothes, does that really matter? It's the old, it's the old adage. Like if Jesus came into most of the churches today, he wouldn't qualify to be a pastor. Mm. He doesn't have the degrees. He doesn't have the clothes. He doesn't have the tight jeans and all that stuff. So yeah. anyway, there's my That's soapbox. True. I'm done. No, I think it's a great reminder too. And it's one of those things. I do think that I've seen the church grow in this area, at least the churches that I've been a part of. It does seem like they care less about what's on the outside and more about what it just earnestly seeking after God. And I think some of the challenges that we faced here in the last several years as a culture have made Christians or the people that claimed that they were Christians to sit up and say, well, what do I really believe? What do I really yeah. stand for? What does God really want from me? And what does that mean for my life? If I know all this is true, going back to your point, if I really believe what I say, these words that are coming out of my mouth should have a meaning and I should look different. I, you know, this should should have an impact on everything, uh, on who I am. I, it should be transformative. And if it's not, then you got to ask some serious soul questions and you got to get yeah. together with God and have that conversation. This is FaithWorks Live. We'll be right back. You know how much we love Animus beef at the Haney House. It is delicious. It's wonderful quality. It's naturally raised with no steroids, antibiotics, and they just do what they do so well. High quality beef at the Animus Farm. But did you know you can actually see where your beef comes from? You can visit Animus Farm. The fine folks, Dave and Mary Lynn, are the most hospitable folks I may have ever met. They'll let you feed a bottle calf and then meet the cows at Animus Farm. And open Opening soon is a special treat, Mulberry Cottage, uh, for a stay at the Animus Farm. It's a family-oriented getaway, and they'll let you hike the trails out there. You can forage or bird watch or just enjoy the beautiful sunset from their porch. I'm very excited to check it out myself. And they'll even let you do a cookout with Animus Beef. Order your beef or your next vacation at AnimusBeef.com. That's O-H-N-E-M-U-S Beef.com. <laughs> In today's world, security has never been more vital. And at FaithWorks Live, we're proud to partner with Veragard Security. It's a professional physical security service, and they're really raising the bar in security and private investigations. Whether you need a team of professional officers to protect what you have worked hard to build, or their mobile security units for multiple properties or large locations, from business or corporate properties to your home or neighborhood, perhaps you've got an event coming up, they secure quality quality security coverage for events large and small because it's about peace of mind and protecting you, your family, your team, and your property. Settle for nothing less than the best when it comes to your security. You shouldn't have to compromise. When it comes to security, you can trust Veragard. Contact them today at veragard.us. That's V-A-R-A guard.us. For security service, you can trust Veragard. Faith Works Live is the name of the show. Dave, I, I know that there's so many questions that kids have, especially because you're working primarily with youth. You mentioned the equip um, kids and youth camps that we have. And I can link down to your work on, on that below this uh, show as well, which would be great. Everyone should check that out and check out the fine work that you do. Um, but I wonder if you could give us a few of the questions that you see that come up the most so that we can be prepared to answer them. Sadly, this is going to, break your heart um the top three things that we get um suicide which just that just it rips my yeah. soul out um I, I wish i wish what i'm telling you is not true Here, here's how we know this because we when we travel i i've got a question box i don't know how the other three speakers within our our organization do it but i i have a question box that folds up so it's transportable and i put it out and say put your questions in there and nothing's off limits like it doesn't have to be about something we talked about this week you know i want to know our, our the way we phrase it is what is keeping you from selling out to the lord jesus what is the one thing that if you knew that 
you would sell out to the Lord Jesus. And so um, we tell them to not put their name down because we don't want them to be afraid to ask a question. And so this is how I know, like, we're getting the legitimate thoughts because we're not, we're not asking them to put their name down. So suicide, anxiety, and depression. And I lumped those two together. Um, again, a heartbreaker. And then LGBTQ. It's the, um, I may not be dealing with it, but my friends are. And I don't know, the church hasn't done a good job on teaching me how to address these topics, you know. So those are the primary three things we get. And um, to qualify that a little bit more, this year I've been given a talk. It's called Who Do You Say I Am? And it's all about who does Christ say we are? Not who do we say he is? That's important. But flipping the question around and going, okay, Jesus. And and like you said, the mirror before, I love that you said that. Because I even tell them, like, even the mirror can be the biggest liar. You know, like, so we shouldn't listen to our outside friends and family and all this stuff if they're sowing negativity into who we are and we shouldn't listen to the mirror, we certainly shouldn't listen to pop culture because pop culture is not reality. Um, and so I walk them through and then, and then at about the midpoint, I play a, a, a video. It's a really well done, like spoken word video um, dealing with depression. And so after I do, I've, I've given them all a piece of paper. I said, I want you to write down what you see when you look in the mirror. And, uh, when they write down what they, Carl, uh, the founder of our ministry, Carl Kirby, um, he doesn't always get to be there towards the end of camp. And this is the last night of camp that I do this. Well, two, three weeks, I've lost, whatever it was, a few weeks back, he was there at, at the ending of camp. And I I did this. And, and so then I tell him, I said, write it down. Again, don't put your name on it. And then just drop it here on the altar. And here's what I end up doing. I say, look, I can't get through to you this week if this is what you feel about yourself. And I don't even have to wonder what's going to be on the paper. I can pick up a random piece of paper and go, I can't get through to you if you feel like, and I start reading it and it's fat, ugly, useless, um, annoying, shouldn't be alive. Um, just all these, just too skinny, too talkative, too quiet, too, just all these different things that these kids and Carl Carl's not the most emotional man in the world. You know, he, Carl is straight down the, that's why he makes such a good apologist because he's just straight down the middle, you know? And he was, um, he was visibly moved to see just how low of, of a view that these kids have on themselves. So when we talk about, you know, they're putting anxiety, depression, suicide in the question box thing, how do I deal with this? Um, I think the number one thing we've got to deal with is getting back to a biblical literacy where these kids understand um, we're showing them that the Bible's true, but not only that it's true, here's what the Bible says about your value. And and I, I hate, hate's a strong word. I'm not a fan of when churches and there's particular denominations who are worse about this than others, and maybe even families or households who do this. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. You're mm-hmm. not worthy. You're not worthy. And that's these kids. That's that's I generate. I I know adults who are like, I'm not. Wor-, and I get the sentiment, but boy, is that bad church lingo? Because here's what that boils down to: there's no. Re- if you're not worthy, then Christ shouldn't have gone to the cross for you. And so we tell them in one breath that Christ, if you were the only one, Christ would have gone to the cross. You know, another church lingo: if you were the only one, He would go to the cross just for you, which is true. But then how do we turn around and tell them you're not worthy of anything? You're a low down, rotten sinner. You're not worthy. You're not worth. Well, after generations, these kids don't feel worthy of anything. They don't feel worthy of love from their friends and family. Well, how are they supposed to feel love from God when they can't even like psychologically understand the, the reality that's in front of them with their friends and family. And so, you know, we get a lot of different questions, you know, we don't get, you know, what's cool. We don't get the, did Adam and Eve have a belly button? Who was Cain's sister or who, who did Cain marry? Those, those types of questions seem yeah. to be gone. A lot of them are um, socially driven. Just, just what do I do? Um, what do I do in this environment that keeps telling me that my Christian worldview isn't acceptable or isn't livable, you know, because we're, you know, the cake baker refuses to bake a cake. They're sued. They lose their business. How do I operate? In a world like that, how do I 
reach my um, atheist friends or my my agnostic friends, you know. And so those are a lot of the questions that we get. And then you get some, you know, off the cuff, like real deep theological questions. And I love those. And so they're, they're, it's a mixed bag that you get. But I would say the, the majority of everything that we get, if I had to lump it into one area, it's all um, sociologically, physiologically, not physiologically, psychologically. How do I contend with this world that I'm living in? Because being a Christian isn't the easiest thing to do. So I, I would I would kind of lump it all together in a sum like that. What kind of foundational things? I know we're we're running out of time here, but the again, for me, it's recognizing the world that we're in and the moment that we're in right now. And there's I see people that do struggle with these big questions, but the lies that the culture has pushed for so long and the fact that we have as well as the broken families aspect, because there are people that are growing up without those basic foundations that are supposed to mirror and, and show us a picture of God and his love, right? Mom and dad are supposed to be there to show you your heavenly father. And if you don't have that, that stability and that basic understanding, those pictures are broken down at such a, such a deep level for so many people that I don't think that should be overlooked as well. We're, we're trying to recreate um, some of the basic foundations now. And, and I mean, there's no better place to start than right at the beginning for a lot of folks, but, um, I, it, it is a little challenging sometimes to realize, okay, this is where we are. This is ground level ground zero for a lot of people, especially kids when they're finding out about Jesus for the first time. So how do we, if we're speaking to Christians now, and maybe this has been just like part of something, you, you know, you've been living biblically for a long time. You can't even imagine what it would be like without that. But how do we reach out to a culture that really doesn't know? Well, let me let me let me twofold that because you you mentioned the home, and that's probably our biggest discovery over the past five years of doing this. That um, it's dawned on us more than ever that the home is it the home. We we can do everything we can to like give these kids a foundation that is strong that is. Um, something that'll cause them to go home from camp with a bold, bold faith. I mean, they equip is a game changer. Maybe we can talk about that in a minute, just kind of go over the, the highlights of it. Um, hold on. I got to send a voicemail. There we go. Um, equip is a game changer where um, we're, we're literally seeing these kids go home different, but if they go home different and Christ isn't emulated in the home, mom and dad have kind of a callous faith. Um Maybe they barely have a faith at all. It's very hard for, or at least a visible faith when I say that, meaning like they're not living openly their life for Christ. It's very hard for the kids to maintain that um, that level of spiritual energy when they go home to continue their growth because they're going home and they're kind of landing on flat soil versus a, a nice garden that they're going home to. And so I actually put together a talk. It's about a year old now. I've given it probably about 20 times um, and I need to give it 4,000 more times. So mm. if your listeners are interested in having us, we, we ask that you cover our, our expenses on getting to your church, but we don't have a set honorarium. And the reason for that is, is we, it's not about money. It's about getting, um, about keeping this generation from leaving and going and getting the next generation that left already. You know what I mean? And, and for some of those that's 40 or 50 years old who yeah. they still need, you know, we'll follow up with how do we reach them in just a second, but um, put together a talk. It's called License to Parent, and it's based off a friend of mine has a nationally syndicated radio show. Um, Trace Embry has one. It's called License to Parent. And I just I love the concept because he's he's basically like I'm giving you your license to parent because even in Washington, I think it's actually in four states now. Um, they've passed a bill that says if parents don't recognize their LGBTQ transgender child wanting to trans from male to female or female to male, that the state can come in, take the children into state custody, and the parents can go to jail for not recognizing the trans. So parents feel like they've been backed into a corner where they can't even parent their kids. And the school system telling them, hey, look, it's up to us to train your kids. Don't you worry about it and all this yeah. stuff. And so licensed the parent, the concept is, but what I do in that talk is I go through very simple ways that parents can um, utilize the home time, time at home when they're face-to-face, -face, which A, how to increase the face-to-face -face time, B, what are some of the 
Um, you've got to be intentional about the priorities I'm making that face to face time, like dinner. That should be a non-negotiable. You know, it's kind of like when we go on a cruise with friends, you know, we we go on the boat and we say, hey, everybody do your thing. But at dinner, we're meeting. That's going to be our time. It's the same thing at home. Everybody's got these crazy schedules. This one wants to do this. This one wants. I get it. But dinner should be a non-negotiable. So you can do a heart check at your table every single night, at least five nights out of the seven. That you should. That's your time to do a heart check with the family. So we've got to be intentional about reaching the parents and giving the parents. And listen, I realize there's some single parents out there that um, that's not God's design. And my hat's off to them, like seriously. But part of the the teaching on the on the license to parent is we've got to find, let's say it's a single mom, there's got to be a man in the church or men in the church who can come alongside and help that mom with the male role model. Yes. You know what I mean? Because it's not fair to say to the mom or a single dad, you've got to play both roles. We're not designed to do that. But there's a simple fix that says, okay, maybe we got outside of God's design for family and there's a single family, whether that be through divorce or cancer. It, it could be multiple reasons why there's a single family being raised. But there's solutions and the church should be there for that. Mm -hmm. But again, we have to be intentional about that. But as far as reaching those who are outside the church, make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Jesus. That's what I've been saying for years. You you, you can't. We started a new campaign. It's called One More Matters. And you can go to um your, your text and just type in 51555 and just where to send it to. And then, and then the like what you're saying, just to, type in OMM. One more matters, O M M, and send it to us, and you'll get a link there that will give you encouragement in a place that we're asking for one dollar a month from people, just one dollar a month. It reoccurring one. We're, we're in front of 150, 200 thousand people a year. If every person we're in front of, we can make these camps free, and we can extend our outreach even more. But I always challenge people. It's like that's our ask from you is like one dollar a month. But what I want to challenge you is I want you to write down one person's name that you know loves that needs Jesus. And I don't want you to just pray for them because that's going to be the starting point. Pray, pray, pray. And when you're done praying for them, pray again. But I want you to invite them for dinner. I want you to watch their kids or watch their dogs or do something that's going out of your way to show them the hands and feet of Christ. Mm -hmm. And But don't focus on two people or 10 people or on 100. Pick one. And when you're done with that one, write down another name and allow that person. So it's one at a time. Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Jesus. Because most of the time people receive the gospel through relational terms, not through yes. somebody standing on the streets yelling at them. And it's not the pastor's job to do it. It's our job to do it. You know, so make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Jesus. Uh, love it. Absolutely love it. Dave, I wish we had like 16 more hours, but I know your voice will be pulled out. <laughs> so I will <laughs> let you rest. Um, want any very last words as we wrap up here? And uh, I'm sure we can do this another 99 times, God willing. Amen. And Creek don't rise. But uh, any any final thoughts as we wrap up today? Uh, if your parents are a youth pastor, get your kids to equip. We're um, we're looking. We did five this year. We're looking at expanding to um, to more states next year. And and why equip works. And then I'll let you let you run. During the day, we hit them right here. We're we're hitting them hard right here. And we don't teach teenagers. Okay, little Bobby, little Sue. We don't do that. <laughs> we literally we come we come driving, you know. Yeah. And we're hitting them up here, and we're challenging them to think about either A, their Christian faith, or B, why they don't have a Christian faith. But one way they're challenging their thinking. We're getting them to critically think. And then at night, we're hitting them right in the heart. It's more of an evangelical, more of a preacher's message at night. So what we're doing is we're during the day, we're giving them reasons why to believe. And then at night, we're giving them the what to believe. Mm -hmm. And when you connect those two, the why you believe, the what you believe, it's a game changer. They are literally, I'm seeing lives change every single week. Um, this is our 10th year of doing Equip, and the reason why I started is because there was nothing else like it. My my son was going to camp. He'd come home, and after three days, it was like he had never been to camp. Mm -hmm. I thought there's got to be a solution for this, and what I realized is camp was, generally speaking, just focused on the experience. They weren't focused on actually training and equipping and discipling. So this is a discipleship camp where we're equipping the kids while we've got them there. We, in, in a six-day camp, we sit them down 17 times. and my favorite comment was just recently in Georgia, a girl got to camp, never been there before. She looked at the schedule and saw that she's going to sit down 17 times in six days. She literally said, she was like, 
I just wanted to go home. I, I was like, no way. And then her final comment was, but I can't wait to come back next year. Like that's, <laughs> that's when you, when you give the, you to full circle, are these kids receptive? They're more than receptive. They're, they're hungry. So get your kids to equip. Our website is um, rforh.com. It's short for reasons for hope. Um, rforh.com. Mm-hmm. You can also go to your app store or your Google Play store, type in rforh, and you'll see a black background with a blue asterisk. That's our, our um, app. It's a free download. There's no in-app purchases like that. You know what I mean? Like it's free and it'll take you months to go through all the um all the stuff we've got five minute videos, 60 second videos, hour long videos, 30 minute stuff. We've got everything for every attention span. We've got blogs, we've got TV shows, we've got everything is, is on that app. So I would encourage you. Um, there's something called debunk that we have. And I think we've got 27 of them up there. And if you run into somebody in the streets that says, oh, the Bible can't be trusted, pull out your phone within 30 seconds, play a video that shows them all the evidence why. And now you've just started a conversation because mm-hmm. be a friend, bring a friend to Jesus. That's we've given you the tools on how to do that. So, yeah, mm-hmm. get in, get involved. Let us know how we can help. All of our speakers are available to come to your church. So just, yeah, let us know. And, and we're there for you. Highly recommend all those resources. Dave Glander has been our excellent guest. Brother, I appreciate it. Now go drink some tea, go rest, take a quick nap. (laughs) Throat coat, honey, and throat coat, honey, and lemon. (laughs) Been living on it. (laughs) Take care. Well, I'd love to talk to you again. And when you're out in our area, because Equip comes to Iowa and you do uh, camps and events here in Iowa, that's going to be awesome. So people can find that. I'll link to that as well in the link for this podcast. Are you in, are you in Eastern Iowa? No, we're out in, we're in central, but you know, it's not too far. How far away is Cedar Rapids? Um, About a couple hours. Okay. Go to our website in September. We're doing an Equip rally there. I think it's like the 16th to the 18th or so. I don't, you can't, it's right in the middle. Come to the Equip rally. You'll get a taste of what Equip is like because we're looking at starting a, um, and equip in, in Eastern Iowa area ish in that area. Awesome. I love it. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, God bless you. God bless this awesome ministry. And I'm, if anybody's listening again, I love that, that notion of just one more, if we can make a difference yeah. in one person's life, just, just opening the door to friendship. That is a huge, uh, I think Billy Graham actually said that he's like imitating Christ is opening the door to friendship. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's, a, it, that doesn't take to i mean that doesn't that is not a super intellectual exercise anybody can do that i love that you're equipped to go be a friend to someone and that's not scary you can go be a friend today i love it it takes Uh, two seconds to be kind god bless you dave and all that you do and i'd love to have you back sometime soon well i would love to be back thank you for having me this time take care brother um until next time you've been listening to faith works live uh we have a mission so let's be about it There's no better time than now to stand for life. And you can stand with Iowa's original pro-life organization, Pulse for Life. They're the longest standing nonprofit pro-life organization in Iowa, and they are dedicated to informing, educating, and inspiring a new generation to value the sanctity of all human life from fertilization until natural death. They serve at the state house. They educate in classrooms, at events. They proudly serve on the coalition of pro-life leaders. They are on the front lines of the battle against this throwaway culture of death that we see all around us, and we are winning ground. Hearts and minds are changing, and the pro-life movement is continuing to grow. And you can be a part of the exciting things that are happening right here in our own backyard at pulseforlife.org and get your finger on the pro-life pulse. Sign up for their newsletter, find ways that you can make a difference, and how you can change hearts and minds with their pro-life apologetics course, pulseforlife.org. Amazing, Ellen. Cannon scene. Take one. Oh, uh, wait, guys. You're going to shoot me out of this cannon to hit a target that's two miles away? That's right, Ellen. Well, why does it say on the side of this cannon, rated for one mile only? Because that's as far as it will shoot. Well, shouldn't we have at least a two-mile cannon? Ellen, some people believe that to get to heaven, all they have to do is be good. You're going to illustrate that without Jesus, we fall short. Yeah, about a mile short. Okay, climb in the cannon. Uh, are you sure this suit is fireproof? It's made out of children's pajamas. Okay. Uh, uh, wait, uh, guys? What, Alan? Well, shouldn't the cannon be pointed up? Wouldn't have the same impact. And action! 
Wow. That's a take. I only flew four feet. Alan, we all fall short of God's standards. That's why we need Jesus and his gift of forgiveness. There's got to be a better way to make these points, guys. Another message from Lifeline Productions, the comic strip of radio at lifelinepro.com. When a woman faces an unplanned pregnancy, every possible emotion goes through her head. Where can she go for help and for hope? She can go to Inner Visions. Here in our metro, we have two healthcare clinics where she will find hope and help. From free pregnancy testing and STD testing to free ultrasounds, InterVision serves women and men with STDs who find themselves in vulnerable situations. They're completely free of charge because of generous donations from folks like you. And their medical clinics help their patients get all the information that they deserve that empowers them to make life-affirming decisions. That's what they do at InterVisions Healthcare Clinics right here in Des Moines. Learn more at intervisionshealthcare.org. That's intervisionshealthcare.org. And you can call 24 hours a day at 515-440-CARE. That's 515-440-2273.